I am here with Pat Mills, the co-creator of Slain, the uh, first editor of 2000 AD, creator of many other characters on uh, 2000 AD, Nemesis the Warlock, uh, plenty of others. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I've just blanked on half the things you've done. <laughs> Flesh, uh, or, you know, a lot. 45 years of characters just on 2000 AD, never mind the, the non-2000 AD works you've created, like Martial Law. Uh, Metal Zoic, uh, a curios, curiosity there. Uh, but we're here to talk about Slain today. Uh, or Slonia. Um, I'm, I apologise for jumping between the two. I will try and say Slonia. I really will. Uh, how, how do you pronounce it? Um, well, I, I, you know, I started off calling it Slain uh, because I didn't really think about the accent. And it was only after, I don't know... Um, uh, quite a few years, actually, that I got around to asking my Irish relatives, and I said, "What does that? Uh, what does that accent do?" And then they said various uh, uh, versions of Slonia or whatever. Uh, but of course, I I'm also guided by the um, Penguin um, uh, drama, uh, audio drama of uh, the Horn God, and uh, I sort of raised that with them, and and they said, uh, and I think they're probably right that because it's generally known as uh, slain, that uh, uh, that's the version that they've gone for. Um, I, I guess when, you know, when you start out, you don't realize, you think it has potential, but you don't really know that, it, that one day um, it's going to, you know, it could end up as an audio play or, or uh, any number of things. And, uh, you know, you're just thinking at the time, well, that looks good. I just go ahead with it, you know. Yeah, I guess writing it down, you don't have to worry about it too much. It's, no, uh, not at all, no. Just in the reader's minds. Um, when you were starting off creating the character, obviously it's the, the Irish uh, culture behind it, w was there any sort of pushback on that? Or was that something that you, you desperately wanted? And why did you choose to place this character in 2000 AD, which isn't known for fantasy, isn't necessarily known for the, the mythological characters at that time. It, it's changed a little bit since then, but it's a very unique character to introduce in 2000 AD in the early 80s. Um, yeah. Well, let's pick, up like... on, let's, let's pick up on that last one, uh, first of all. Um, I, it, was, um, uh, it was certainly the attitude, I think, uh, of, of Forbidden Planet, I think, for a while. Um, that, you know, um, why is there a sword and sorcery uh, character in uh, 2000 AD? But I, I think that was um, uh, really a little bit of from that era where the Forbidden Planet tail was wagging the dog. Um, let me come back to the original concept of... Um, of 2000 AD, which was uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And it gradually um, uh, kind of shrunk down as time went on. So uh, to give you two examples, um, the original Judge Dredd was very much a, um, a horror story. Um, and um, when I was discussing it with John, he felt that the science fiction elements in the comic were stronger than the horror elements. And, uh, um, and so I, I, I ditched that story. And the thing was, there, were, there was an awful lot of stories, so I could afford to do that. Um, so if you like, horror was originally in the 2000 AD mix. And also another one, uh, there was a disaster story. In fact, there were two disaster stories because it's not something we really think about uh, today because um, I don't think that genre is recognized as a separate thing in a way that uh, it was in the 70s, you know, Poseidon Adventure and all that kind of thing. But uh, disaster movies were, were uh, big box office. And uh, so I had um, um, uh, two um, disaster stories. Um, one of which I think became, uh, what was it? Uh, um, Planet of the Damned, which I think ran briefly in, uh, ran, ran in Star-Lord. Um, so there were lots of different styles. And in Planet of the Damned, for example, the uh, protagonist is a, is a barbarian. Um, so 
you know, th this refining it down to science fiction it is uh, very much a matter of perception, really. Um, there had always been that opportunity for, uh, for other possibilities. I mean, even I think Nemesis came before Slain. And uh, so I, I don't know what you would describe it as, uh, but uh, um, I don't know, a science fiction fantasy, perhaps. You know, the guy's going around waving a sword, he's up against knights, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So it's not, um, uh, it never seemed that unusual to me, but there was a further reason for it at the time. Um, I, I'd have to sort of actually check back what movies were around, but I seem to remember, uh, and it was quite unusual at that time, that uh, um, sword and sorcery films were really starting to um, take off. Um, I, I think it was pre Conan. Uh, I couldn't, yeah, tell yeah I think the first Conan one... film might have been 81, maybe, maybe 82. Yeah, 82. yeah, it could yeah. have been, could well have been. And there was, there was a couple of others as well. There were two or three others. Uh, I can only remember offhand, um, a rather weak one. Um, Simbad with Patrick Wayne, who I think was John Wayne's son, and obviously it didn't really leave that much of a dent in the, um, uh, you know, in the popularity, but um, so they were there in the, um, you know, in movies and so on. And I think there was a feeling at the time, uh, which actually probably didn't work out, uh, that heroic fantasy uh, was going to be the next big thing. Um, now you could say, well, Star Wars, you know, but that's science fiction, even though it does have elements like knights and so on and so forth. So uh, there were several movies around and there was a sense that it was going to be big. And um, I, I think that probably didn't work out. Uh, I don't recall any kind of Game of Thrones at the time. And I don't, I'm not sure the Conan, I know people were quite fanatical about Conan, but I, I, I'm not so sure the general public was, I, I don't know. So there you go. You know, it's, it's the market forces that would, um, uh, come into it as well. Um, now you also said, was there any pushback um, uh, in terms of the Irish connection? Um, no, I've, I've never come across it, which is a little strange because, uh, um, you know, it, it would have, it might have been a factor, perhaps, um, you know, in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, uh, I remember... That's kind of what I was thinking of with the with the troubles um yeah that's what i'm but, thinking of yeah. and uh, th th there was maybe uh, i think uh it, it was pre the internet pre twitter so <laughs> they they couldn't get at you, you know? no. <laughs> um but um yeah there were uh, from memory there was a couple of letters so it's real you know snail mail old school you know uh somebody saying do you think it's uh I mean, this would have been maybe two or three years after, maybe even longer after Slain had come out, saying, well, you know, you've got the, the Red Branch, which is associated with Ulster and that kind of thing. Um, so that was really the limit of, um, of any kind of pushback that, that I recall. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it was, I never really thought about it, to be honest. Um, I think being... Um, being of Irish extraction, but being in um, uh, in England and not being in London, um, you don't really become aware of that uh, uh, that side of things. I think um, I think some of my Irish relatives might might well have said something different. And then, of course, there's the whole reason for for doing it in the first place, which was to um, connect with my Irish roots, Celtic roots. See what. Uh, um, uh, what it all meant, because um, I think my relatives were uh, regarded, well, I don't think they had any particular opinion on it, uh, but I suppose if I pressed them, uh, they might just about acknowledge Cucullin, because there's a statue of him outside the, uh, um, uh, the post office in Dublin, I think. And, uh, but for the most part, they were all regarded as, as pagans and uh, so Irish mythology and magic and so on re really probably started with uh, St. Patrick, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The, the um, a few other sort of 
unique things about Slane and and want to bring in talk about Angela Angela Kincaid mm. then Angela Mills. Yeah. Um, Slane has a family. Uh, he's this handsome, smiling hero. Um, talk about um, Angela and her influence on the strip. Was she Irish yeah. or was she English? No, not at all. No, no, no. Uh, English, very English. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's always, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I did sort of ex- uh, go into it in my book, um, Kiss My Axe, to sort of try and um, really bring that across. The, the thing is, when you've got this, when the saga has been going for so long and there's so many books, um, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the, the first six pages are absolutely crucial. You know what I mean? Mm. Because they're, they're six blank pages and whatever you put on those six blank pages are going to set the style for forever. And um, um, so, you know, I often think, God, you know, if only she had done, um, um, let's say, well, if you'd done a few more episodes, at least, we, we, we could have developed some of the things that she was particularly keen on. And, uh, and one of them, of course, was the, the smiling hero. Uh, now, today, it's like, well, so what? You know, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, 2000 AD heroes who smile. But it wasn't at the time. I know it sounds really bizarre. Uh, there, was, there were certain rules that were kind of, we were all locked into. Now, it's not because we're trying to be dogmatic or anything. It's just we know what the reader's like. And so we want to give them what they don't want. So one of them was all the heroes, you, know, you think about them at that time, they all scowled. I mean, yeah. you know, and it wasn't necessarily that they were copying um, Judge Dredd. Um, because I think uh, I think heroes have been scowling before that on action and probably on battle as well. Um, smiling was disapproved of. Um, so when Angela had a uh, a couple of uh, I think uh, one particular scene where he's leaning back in the bar and having a drink and flirting with the barmaid and smiling, I, I remember saying, "Oh, I don't know if that's a good thing." You know what I mean? Because I've been so programmed by what, you know, the um, what the readers were after. And she rightly made the point. Yeah. You know, he smiles. Why shouldn't he smile? Uh, because, uh, you know, he's had a good day and so on. Yeah. Um, and so I think it, it seems quite small, but it was actually um, really important that uh, um, that element. And then, of course, there was the other thing. Uh, which was um, um, really down to me, which I, I've talked about quite a lot, um, which was at first I assumed he had to have a helmet. I thought, no, every 2000 AD character, again, you think about uh, the, the, the heroes contemporary with him, um, they all had helmets as far as I can recall. There might have been the odd exception, but arguably they may not have been so successful. So we had this idea that heroes had to wear helmets and, and they had to scowl. And, and they, that was pretty much set in stone. And uh, that's, hmm, I mean, even today, I think you've got to be careful. If you make, uh, if you make a character um, a little too easygoing uh, or having too much of a range, um, it may work for some artists and some stories, but it doesn't always work. And also, bear in mind, at the time, I mean, there are some notable exceptions, but there weren't that many artists who were actually doing facial expressions. So if you've got guys wearing helmets, um, it can be a bit of a cop out or it can be you just don't get around to uh, showing those expressions. And of course, uh, you know, writers must take some responsibility here as well. Because I mean, if your characters are just basically saying blasters to stun or something like that, it's not really giving um, the artist much of an opportunity um, for ca- uh, facial characterization. And bear in mind, I come from um, a girls' comic background where facial expression is everything. And th- there's some absolute artistic geniuses from there uh, who 
you know, their story is completely sold on their facial expressions. Uh, John Armstrong, uh, the artist on Bella, uh, yes. being a case in point. Hmm. You talked about if Angela had gone on to do more episodes. And in your book, you mention that one of your, your small regrets is the death of, of Slane's father um, on the, the Bride of Crom storyline. In fact, it was over so quickly and he didn't yeah. really react. I do wonder if, if Angela had have drawn that story, she would have pressed you to kind of expand yeah. on that. That seemed like something. Absolutely. Might have done. Oh yeah. Because um, we, all of us, I think when we're, when we're dealing with uh, major events in heroes lives, like the death of a father. Now, um, not just the writer's gonna have a point of view on that, the artist is too. So it'd be very, very normal. And she would challenge me on a, on a, on a lot of things and say, well, I, you know, you know, she was very much um, the co-creator on it. You know, uh, sometimes I think with, um, uh, perhaps with foreign artists, where they don't get a chance to discuss the story uh, with the writer, uh, they are the co-creator, but they don't, um, they don't interact. But, you know, uh, Angela and I are in the same living space. So, you know, we're interacting all the time. And yeah, you're absolutely right. She would have picked up on that. And who knows, I might even have, um, I might even have said, yeah, why have I done it that way? You know what I mean? Because this is the thing. Um, the nature of comics, particularly at that time, is... Um, you write them at speed. And I had gone way over on my time budget on it. I spent so long developing the story that, you know, you've got a mortgage, you've got kids, they're going to school and university and all that kind of stuff. So you've got to think, right, I've got to, I've got to speed up now. So you, you, if you've gone through maybe too long a development period, and I had on Slain, God, I, I dread to think how long I spent on it. You think, oh, okay, right, so there's a scene here, maybe his dad dies, and you're not really thinking enough about it. Um, um, what should happen is, especially with a major event like that, is that you maybe go through two or three drafts, or you do what uh, uh, Mick McMahon famously described as staring out the window time. So, you know, when you come to it, oh yeah, well, his dad's in the Wicker Man. His dad's a bit of a shit. Um, well, let's just kill him off. I think that's roughly how the process went. And, and also thinking, um, how do I feel about him? And um, hmm, not much, you know, very shut down. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I explore that in the book. And, you know, it, it kind of opened up um, uh, an interesting can of worms, which I'm quite happy to um, share with the readers because it, but it looked really weird you know, when I was coming to, um, to, to write about it, thinking um, to write about all these stories, thinking what was wrong with me? My God, that's such an obvious um, emotional opportunity there. So to come back to what you're saying, yeah, there's no way Angela would have missed it. And it might have reflected her own um, feelings about her own father, for example. So you would have had that. It always comes into it. You know, it's, it's not just, the the province of the writer you know the, the the artist is very much part of the equation yeah just just sort of jumping ahead a little bit but i will come back to to the intervening artists did you know at that point you were going to, going to introduce slain's own son in the king so he he himself had been an absent father to to kai's younger years or, or was that something that came later um i think that was pretty much uh on the cards from the beginning because it was drawing on the legend of Deirdre, um, who's, who's locked away uh, so that the, the, the king's um, got her all to himself until she's um, of a legal age for, for them to consummate their relationship. And I, I kind of, I think I must have thought to myself, well, if Slane's, uh, you know, broken that, that rule, and um, and has been involved in a relationship with her. It's it's very likely that she would be pregnant, and therefore there would be a son. And so it, it was a little hazy in my mind, but it but it was always there uh, that that possibility. Yeah, yeah. Because it's another aspect that sets the character apart from other two thousand characters. He is uh, is someone who's had 
relationships. He's had a sex life. Um, yeah. That's not something that really goes into 2000 AD very often. Um, but it's yeah, it's that, that's real true. Um, I I I also did it in Charlie's War, where um, uh, yeah, he he got married. Um, his um, I think some members of his family died in the um, influenza pandemic in. 1918, 1919, and of course he had a um, uh, has a, a son uh, called um, called Charlie again. And uh, uh, you know, I think when I was when I was writing that in the back of my mind, I was thinking if I can get enough material uh, to make World War II work, uh, then I'll carry it on Charlie's War into World War II. But I mean, it's going off on a tangent here. But just briefly, I just couldn't find the material I wanted uh, cheaply enough and effectively enough to carry it on. Um, so, yeah, coming back to Slane. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think that applies to some extent to, to many of my characters because, of course, uh, Nemesis uh, got married uh, and um, she has a rival and, uh, and they have a son, Thoth. So, yeah, it... it it generally doesn't happen in British comics. And maybe one of the reasons is because um, if the stories are weekly, um, you know, you, you've got to get through material really quickly to, to make the story satisfying. So you don't always necessarily uh, make long-term plans. Um, I do, but I think uh, it's quite understandable that not every um, creator would do that yeah With, without going into your private life too much were you a father at that point or were you oh yeah later? yeah 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 um yeah no 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 I don't mind uh, talking about it at all um I think um I think you but you know the, the chances are the majority of um uh writers and artists you know were probably uh um um, you know, parents at, at probably a relatively early point in their uh, career, let's say 70s or 80s or whatever. And I, I mean, I remember um, um, uh, Glenn Fabry saying to me when I had a um, slain um, at the um, uh, Colchester story where Boudicca uh, massacres uh, men, women and children, which she did. Uh, that he is part of that. And he, um, he took exception to that at the time. And I actually think he was right. Um, uh, uh, but that's in retrospect, <laughs> whereas in retrospect, he thinks, oh, maybe it didn't matter. You know, it, 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 he felt differently about it. We all look back on these things from, from different vantage points. And he was saying that at that time, uh, he was a, a, a new father. So it, it resonated with him. He was thinking, oh, I'm not very comfortable with this, which is totally understandable. And, I, and again, I said in my book that if I thought about it more, um, and again, it comes down to staring out the window, I'd have thought, is there a way whereby slain can um, uh, be still at this, uh, this awful massacre of civilians uh, and not... Uh, and not take part in it mm -hmm. and um and I actually worked out a way but it, it took me about an hour you know what I mean I was just because the last thing you want to do is um have a cop out here I mean the readers would kill me if I did because they'd say well he's a he's a, a mad spiky haired Celt and the the Romans have really pissed them off and you know he, he they have different far. moral standards to today but I uh, so I, at the time, again, it's speed writing. I would have said, okay, well, I can't see what he can do here, so he's just going to have to do it. Um, whereas in retrospect, I would say, hmm, let me think about this a bit more. And, you know, there's that kind of golden rule in writing, isn't there? Um, every problem is an opportunity. So rather than ducking it, like with the other example, um, you know, you really think about it and suddenly the story is actually richer because it's answering those doubts in the reader's minds where they're thinking, well, I'm not that comfortable about it, but it's just a story and he's a mad cow anyway, you know? 
So uh, these days I'm much more attentive to um, those kind of um, warning bells that you hear. I, I think when you're writing at speed, you you can't hear the you don't hear the warning bells. You just got to ignore them because you've got to think I've got to get this story out. You know? Yeah. Um, talk about Glenn. Um, going back to Angela, there's, there's a, a line going from from Angela to Glenn, for sure, and, and passing through Ballard and Ellie. Um, the, the odd one out there is is Mick McMahon, who yeah. who stylistically stands out. Um, how how do you how do you square that circle in terms of you, you in previous uh, like Judge Dredd epics you would have Brian Bolland and you would have Mick McMahon and they they would work together. But, yeah, and I think the first sort of year of Slain that it is one long story of of uh, the end of the first episode end of end of Angela's episode he gets the news that he's got to go back to his tribe he you know he he feels the need to take over to grow up. To, to take control and, and be responsible. And, and the, the first storyline is him traveling back. Um, and so it is, you know, essentially one long epic road journey back to yeah. the tribe uh, before you get to uh, slaying the king with, with Glenn Fabry. Um, do you feel like the, the, the Mick McMahon episodes are fantastically well drawn, but they don't quite fit with what the, the style of the series is? Yeah, um, I don't know how you how you feel about that. Yeah, I I, I mean it's um uh, again it's it's a complex. Uh, I hadn't realised how complicated that period was. So when I when I came to write about it, uh, in in my book originally, I had a kind of uh, what you might call condensed version of events because I just vaguely remembered it from uh, I sat down to write it, and then I realised. Actually, um, that's not quite true. So then I wrote a second draft and uh, with other uh, aspects. It's quite complex what, what, what was going down. And eventually I wrote about, um, I don't know, three drafts of that whole era to make sense of, you know, to, to understand. Because memory can, you can just say, oh, well, that didn't work out. And we, we tried that. And, you know, it's all summarized and memory is condensed. But finally, I realized I was actually not angry with Mick, but angry with other um, uh, people involved with that era because I felt that uh, Angela had been really badly let down. And I, I suppose, played a role in that because I should have seen it more clearly and perhaps been more protective. But in any event, what, what I found was I was so emotional about it. I said, you know what, I'm going to put this book to one side. So I actually put the book, uh, um, I think maybe a year or so. And when I came back to it, I felt a bit calmer and uh, I could look at it. In effect, there was an attempt to steer Slane in a different direction editorially. I think editorially, they thought that Mick McMahon would be the, um, uh, the, the, the more, more successful version of Slain, rather than the Angela and Ballardinelli version, if you like, which is more, uh, um, I don't know, more legendary. Uh, and Mick had, a com Mick had a completely different viewpoint on it. And, and we had, you know, very friendly discussions about it, but he really wanted to show uh, the Celts as he felt they were. In other words, you know, mud huts and all. Um, and I felt differently about this for, uh, uh, for two reasons. One, I felt that uh, I, I wanted them to feature the way they imagine themselves in, in, in their legends, where they are riding around in fantastic chariots. And I mean, they're more, um, you know, they're more grandiose than any Vikings. Um, but secondly, I was also aware then, and I am even more aware today, um, but the chances are they weren't just a kind of uh, this sort of um, what you might call mud hut culture, uh, that there was a lot more to them. Um, uh, I mean, their, their chariots, for example, um, well, they're two wheeled. They, they had to have had roads on which they were running, whereas the assumption 
we have with uh, is that the Romans brought us roads and all the rest of it, which is a classic uh, uh, excuse of uh, imperialism. And uh, uh, yeah, they probably had, uh, they seem to have had uh, wooden roads. So there was, there was that difference of opinion, which I didn't really mind to that degree. In other words, if an artist feels a little bit differently to me, um, that's okay. Um, and um, and actually, Angela was really the the deciding factor in that because um, I showed her mixed pages, and you probably know the story that I think they don't ask me to explain this. Uh, I think they were on tracing paper or something. Or the, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they were very strange. Um, I think any, if anyone who has one today, they are real collector's items, I'd imagine, because they are not drawn in the way that we know it. Um, and uh, I remember her looking through them and I was saying, what do you think? Uh, because after all, you know, she uh, bowed out of the story, but it's still her um, co-creation. And I remember she took a long time looking at it and she said, this is fucking brilliant. This is great. She was really enthusiastic for exactly the same reason that editorial thought to themselves, actually, you know, Mick is really the way we want Slane to go. Um, never mind the, the ethics of that. Uh, they, they just thought, right, this is the way that this will make the story successful, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, um, and of course, it, it was the opposite uh, that although fandom always embraced Mick, uh, you've got to bear in mind at this point in time, uh, the majority of the readers um, were, what should we call them for one of another definition, mainstream readers. Uh, they might be uh, younger or they're, they're newsstand. They're, they're not buying their comics from comic shops and they have a different perspective. Um, but anyway, I was so encouraged by, um, it was Sky Chariots. And I thought, well, I like it. Uh, I'm a bit worried about the change of style, but Angela's given it the thumbs up. Um, why don't we go, why don't we major on this further? And that was a big mistake. So I had these, uh, as you said, it's like a road movie. I had these uh, lead up stories, which I know there'll be fans today who'll say that they were great. That wasn't how readers saw it at the time. Mike did some lead up stories and it, they were now that much more stylized. Um, now, of course I couldn't have anticipated that, but um, my, my cunning plan to make Sky Chariots even more of an epic uh, actually backfired. And I've, it just goes to show you can, you can, you can get caught out any time. You know, you, you think you've got it figured with the audience yeah. and uh, who could have predicted that? So the net result was that because those early episodes, which were much more stylized, um, they didn't go down well with the readers and therefore it worked against Sky Chariots, even though now it's rec rightly recognized as, as a classic. So, uh, um, and what was even more bizarre was that you, you had this, um, of course it was new. I mean, bear in mind on the cursed earth, everyone liked Bolland, everyone liked McMahon. And so uh, this was, I think the first time where I'd encountered this uh, very sharp division of opinion between uh, between readers, what you might call mainstream readers and fans. Um, often the fans might be older, but not necessarily. And um, uh, so I was, uh, it was quite disturbing because you, I mean, they really got, both sides got very passionate about it. In other words, uh, some people would be saying, this is the most brilliant slain I've ever seen. Mick's work is wonderful. I think these other letters, which was saying exactly the opposite. And I was thinking, oh, Jesus, what do I do with this? You know, how do, yeah. how do I, uh, um, where do we go from here on this? So it was, it was traumatic for all of us. And um, as I say, that you can imagine analyzing the reasons for that and so on. Um, I really needed to make sense of it. Why did this happen the way it, the way it did? And of course, um, Angela's episode um, was um, 
the first, uh, at, I mean, bear in mind, this is a time when uh, the uh, popularity polls uh, were really important to 2018. I mean, and all comics, you know, we all had graph charts and things. And if you, I mean, f just to give you an example, um, we had a, Kevin and I did a nemesis story and we had great uncle Baal, um, who instead of uh, nemesis battling with Torquemada, uh, he's hanging around as, as some of the readers saw it, uh, chatting to his great uncle and the voting, <laughs> they, they, they penalized us. No, they didn't like that. And we, you know, they rang us up, both of us and said, no, that one didn't go down well. So you were, you know, vote, vote charts were really important. And, um, and you know, I, 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 I think rightly so. I, I think you can get a little too, I mean, obviously the, the days of the, you know, what's your favorite story, vote for it. Uh, they've gone, but it was a very accurate way of knowing how things worked. Um, and um, uh, not to my surprise, but I think to others' surprise, um, Angela's story, uh, um, beat Judge Dredd and I, I was thrilled but I wasn't surprised because mm. um, I just felt that what she was doing um, was, was going to resonate with what I would call mainstream readers it might not resonate with um, what should we say uh, more purist fans but they at that point in time uh, were the minority of readers uh, a very vocal minority, but they weren't the majority. Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's a, a the shift it does split people. Um, but mm. I, th I think could you sort of re yeah I think you used the term reboot uh, in, in your book when when you talk about taking a, a short break between uh, Dragon Heist and Time Killer. Um, yeah, where, where you sort of get two artists, David Pugh and Glenn Fabry, onto uh, the, the, the Time Killer epic and into Tomb of Terror. That both those seem to follow in the Angela Mills, uh, Angela Kincaid mould. Yeah. Uh, rather than the, and, and I don't think the, the Mick McMahon era hasn't been reproduced because no one dares try it. And I, I think it's an element of fear that you can't possibly <laughs> well there was one exception and and you 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 you'll probably be able to check this um uh but i did uh, i i did uh steer him away from it and that was simon davis i think if you look at he did an early pinup of slain before he actually really embarked on the saga and i think it was published in 2000 ad um and it showed a very strong uh mcmahon influence uh and I remember saying to him, no, no, please, for God's sake, don't do that. You know, thinking, because if you think about it, this all took place a long, long time ago. But for a lot of readers, it still, it still presses emotional buttons. So just thinking, no, I don't want to rerun of, the, of all, the, all the problems of the past. I think I remember Simon Davis's uh, walk spasm being very spiky, which wasn't something that, I, that had really happened much before and uh, yeah before that, that has that has a slight because it's in color it it, dis, it not distort it kind of hides the fact that actually uh, in retrospect it probably has a McMahon influence although Mick's uh warp spasm was very um uh I, I can only remember seeing it uh, uh uh seeing one example of it uh, when he's when he's a knight of the red branch and he's like 16 and he has the, you know, one eyeball comes out and uh, that was definitely different to everybody else's. Uh, but yeah, maybe, th maybe there's a certain influence there. I mean, I, I thought Simon's uh, warp spasms were really um, going to places no one else had gone before. And I don't know how, um, you know, it's almost like you've got to look at them after maybe another five years to say, how does that all sit in the, in the whole, you know, canon of uh, Slane's warp spasms? Um, they certainly took me by surprise at the time. And, you know, full marks to Simon for originality. Um, and also, it's, it's pretty hard to criticise them. I mean, what do you say? Do you think you could tone that bit down? 
<laughs> Simon or whatever, you know. I mean, my, I, I went by my first reaction, which was, oh, my God, what is that? And I, mm. and I saw that as a, as a positive thing. Um, I don't, I mean, it's, a, it's all murky territory because um, supposing this is a new story appealing, let's say, to, um, to, to, to kids, let's say 12-year-old, 13-year-old, the original 2000 AD audience, it's possible that they may have reacted to that like perhaps the way they saw um, The Incredible Hulk for the first time. Um, but if your audience, as we know, is more likely to be in their 40s uh, or, or older, and they've got fond memories of Ballard and Ellie's warp spasm, which was also pretty bloody weird, um, but kind of cozy and familiar because it's Massimo and we know he does stuff like that. Um, or say um, Simon, Simon Bisley's um, Conan-esque uh, warp spasm. Um, I don't know how far um, Simon Davis's warp spasm resonated with them. Uh, as I say, it might be something that you almost have to look back maybe another few years from now or something. Uh, it's not something that's ever come up in um, uh, amongst, they've never talked about it, which I suppose maybe wrongly I see as a bad sign. In other words, well, why aren't you raving about it? You know, well, at least you're not slagging it off. So that's good. But you know. artists often draw slain with their own face in some in, in some ways. So I wonder if the warp spasm is another sort of uh, uh, interior thing that they're just expressing onto the page and its own unique thing for each individual artist. Yeah, I I, I think slain is attractive to artists because I don't know. Uh, I I think it gives gives artists an opportunity for self expression. Um, which I imagine they don't feel is necessarily as easily available elsewhere. Obviously, mm. it's not available on Dread, which is, which is very visually specific. But there must be other stories. Um, but they do seem attracted to Slane for the opportunity to perhaps draw themselves um, or, or a fantasy version of themselves uh, and to try out different things, which is which is quite daring of them on, on the one hand, because I'm also incredibly hands-on, as everyone knows, as, as a writer. Um, not because I choose to be autocratic on stories, but simply because I, I've got this image in my mind of what the reader's like. And it, as long as it stays within those limits, I, I'm fine with whatever the artist draws. But if they go off those limits, you know, I, invariably, I'm likely to say to them, look, you know, this isn't going to work. I mean, I, I've learned some things the hard way, um, yeah, just by what, what people like or dislike, of which the most obvious one um, would be storytelling. And um, I know that there will be exceptions, but for the most part, I think if, if um, a regular 2000 AD reader has to choose between good storytelling um, and rather so-so um, horror. They will choose that rather than, say, uh, John Hicklinton's wild horror, which I adore, but his storytelling, uh, as we all know, leaves something to be desired. And uh, so I've, with some reluctance, come around to the idea, right, storytelling comes first, and if the horror or the impact is, is a little, um, little wishy-washy. I, I just gotta live with it, you know? Yeah. But I still, I still carry a torch for Johnny and I, I still miss that opportunity to you know, see really wild stuff. But you've gotta go where the audience uh, dictates you go. The box office uh, decides us all. With them. Um... With, with Time Killer and then leading up into Slain the King and then the Horned God, that, that's the end of end of that storyline. But um, and after that, you go into the, the time travel thing. But going before, just before Time Killer, you did a short with Ballard and Ellie called The Battle of Clontarf, which was then kind of repeated in Time Killer. So clearly time travel was on your mind in terms of how to push the character forward beyond 
your your horned god storyline if if you were going to get to that point um how how, how did you come to that opinion of wanting to shift slain from this coming of age story becoming to the 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 slain the horned god storyline into something else and, and push him away from that in, into this time traveling thing well i i think um I, I might be wrong but i think on episode one i think he they refer to uh the uh the t-rex yeah the time the, monster uh, the time monster and that was because of, of, I, I thought to myself, well, where, where has this creature come from? And I, I, obviously there was no room to explore it uh, in that story. But uh, in the back of my mind, it was like it had come through a time gate, one of these um, dolmens. So, in fact, there is a dolmen, I think, featured in episode one. So there was a sense that uh, there was time travel there. From very early on, I was reading all these historical accounts of, of um, the Celts and thinking, how can I get that in the story? And thinking, well, I can't. Boudicca, for example, or mm. King Arthur. I'm thinking, these are fantastic stories. And I cannot see how to feature them in Slain. And I, I came across these references to... Um, Dinas Emrys, the eternal fortress in Snowdonia. So this struck me as, you know, it's a bit like something out of the Time Lords in Doctor Who. And so I, I, I'm always aware of that. But the real clincher was the Battle of Clontarf because I'd gotten hold of this. I mean, it, it seems so strange in the, in the internet era where, you know, you want to look at any historical documents, you just click a couple of buttons, and you can watch, you know, you can read them for free not in that era. I can't tell you how expensive that book was uh, on the Battle of Clontarf. It was, uh, I think, called, uh, uh, I can't even pronounce it, uh, the War of the Gales versus um, a similar word for the, for the Vikings. And it was, um, um, it was a 19th century book, um, authentic text. And uh, I think it probably... Um, it was probably about 50 quid at the time. So that means in today's money, it's a lot more. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, you've really got to make it, you know, you've really got to make it pay. So that I thought, this is great stuff. I've got to use it. So I'm going to use it with Bellardinelli, with that color story, and I'm going to use it again. Because, uh, you know, reading the original text, which is now available online for free, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of galling, you know. Um, you can see how it, it fits. There's even a character called something like Efric, uh, which I think I adapted to Elric, or a very similar name, uh, um, a character with a very similar name to Murdoch, um, which again is a great, great name for a, um, uh, a hero in, uh, in comics. And so it really lent itself. And I, I thought, well, I have to use this. So I worked out this... Um, uh, rather convoluted uh, plot, <laughs> um, which I think, you know, it sort of stands up alongside the kind of stories that you might see in Doctor Who or Mission Impossible. You don't spend too much time agonising over the plot. You just say, is it exciting? So and it's I think, a proper serial. Yeah, it's, it's sort of moving yeah. on to the next adventure. Yeah, and, and I think actually at the time... Um, I think I was writing what was ultimately an abortive Doctor Who. Um, so that was very much on my mind, <laughs> time travel. That probably, probably helped, shall we say, because uh, if, you, if you recall, this was the era where Doctor Who was in, in serious trouble. You know what I mean? It, it, I think it, the series finally collapsed in the late 80s. But yeah. In the, but in the early... Hmm? Was it the Colin Baker era when you were? Yeah, yeah, and and slightly before, or maybe yeah, primarily Colin Baker because I, I ended up um, uh, adapting it, made it into an audio play, which he um, uh, starred in, which he was um, fantastic guy, really really nice guy. He uh, uh, he said, "Why have you got that line there?" And I went, uh, um, <laughs> and he said, "Well, wouldn't it be better if you did it that way?" I said, yeah, you're right, Colin. Thank you. You know, he's a really smashing chap. So I was going through the tortures of the damned on this, uh, on this um, uh, Doctor Who screenplay. Um, 
because there were so many changes of direction, because they were obviously, they knew that uh, the writing was on the wall for them. Um, and uh, so I think some of that uh, seeps into the story and not necessarily in a good way. Some of it is good because it, I think, um, I think it has some of the high tension and excitement of um, that. It's obviously an, you know, a principal element in Doctor Who, uh, or at least the good ones. Um, uh, but scene changes and scene cuts, it's different. It has different on telly. You can have like, two minutes and then you cut to something else. But if you try cutting backwards and forwards in comics a bit too much, um, that's probably a mistake, which I haven't yes, been picked if, up on. If, well, if you've <laughs> only got five pages that. per week as well. Yeah, to... yeah. It's um, um, messing around, um, you know, cutting backwards and forwards. It, it's so much easier on a screenplay than it is in a comic book. You know, the general rule of thumb, which isn't set in stone, but is a, is a good one, is um, change, uh, change the page, change the scene don't change within the page. There are honorable exceptions, but I think that's the safest way to do things. Yeah. yeah. I'm conscious that we're clocking over an hour now, so I'll, I'll just try and wrap up with a few sure. very quick questions. Um, uh, are there any artists that you've wanted to work with that you weren't able to on Slain for one reason or another? Or, or you know, was everyone that you wanted approved? Or was there any... I can't think of, yeah, I can't think of any where uh, I've said, hey, I've got this great artist and I've been turned down. <laughs> um, no, I, I can't think of one. So, um, no, I, 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 I think, uh, no, that, that actually isn't one, which is surprising, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, getting through so many artists and also going through such a, some difficult periods, um, you know, um, I mean, there were several great artists who for one reason or another, very early on, uh, I turned down because I didn't think they were right for Slain and I, I'd still hold to that. But uh, uh, no, there were none who, was, uh, who I was after who um, um, didn't work out, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and you had Slain traveling through time on lots of different eras. We did that get cut short or was there a, an era that you wanted to write a story about that you weren't able to, or, or, did, um, or do you feel like you fully went through all that and then you pushed that behind? I think, um, I think I actually went through uh, all the major historical periods that I wanted to. Um, there were one or two others that uh, fans suggested to me. For example, there's a, an Irish pirate queen from Elizabethan times. And I remember, I remember thinking about her, but I think for the most part, I, I'd um, uh, written what I call the classic historical stories. We had to do William Wallace, King Arthur, mm. uh, Boudicca, um, and there's probably a, a couple of others that don't come to mind right now. Um, so actually when Dave Bishop said, um, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, you know, in effect, he wasn't that keen on the historical uh, stuff. And he said, let's get him back to his tribe. Um, and then, of course, when he does come back to his tribe, it hits a, an entirely new problem because he, he's, not, uh, he's not like Judge Dredd. He's not part of the, the, the system, you know, so he's not comfortable as a high king. Um, not for any length of time. He's a rebel. So, he, OK, he can be a war leader. And so that's really why uh, progressively uh, he moves on from that into the Clint Langley era where, um, you know, he's more um, uh, a warrior again and freed of the responsibilities of kingship, which didn't really seem to suit him. Um, I mean, there are one or two exceptions, but I think for the most part, um, you know, it would make sense in a way, and I could see Dave's logic that, you know, Dredd is, you know, if, you, if Dredd was spending far too much time on the judge quest, uh, judge child quest, or 
you know, in outer space or whatever. I think editorial would have probably said, look, let's get him back to Earth. Let's get him back to Megacity. And that works. That, that's absolutely valid for Dread. But for Slane, it, it, it wasn't so. And, and so there was, there was a little period where um, I think he was a little bit lost there. Um, yeah wasn't as comfortable and of course it coincided with a whole variety of artists who all had their own different vision for slain so it actually uh highlighted um these disparate elements and uh, i mean the readers to be fair um were generally pretty supportive and um you know i think they've uh, they haven't given me as hard a time as say uh, you know you sometimes you know read uh, criticisms of Doctor Who and the fans there really come down. On, they don't like a particular story. My God. But yeah. I, I think I'm touching wood here. I think generally speaking, they've been fairly kind, which is nice. I think so too. Um, it, it's, it's been a great run of stories and, and certainly the, 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 in the nineties when I was reading it and, and Traces of Britain was my favorite one, but um, when I was reading it, it seemed like it was an event when there was a, a slain story running for, for 10 weeks or so. Um, so, so just wrapping up then, um, one, of the, one of the things you've just mentioned now is that I think the, the, the oddity, the, the last oddity of the series is slain becoming High King, but as you say, not feeling very comfortable about the whole thing. Like that, that is not a traditional hero's uh, end point. The, traditionally, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm the king now, I can do whatever I want. But, but you wrote him as like, ah, this isn't, this isn't what I want. This isn't, um, yeah, this isn't for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's oppressive. Um, and I, I think, again, it comes back to the, the whole Celtic character, which is so uh, oddball. It's, it's so anarchic. And um, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a tough one to, um, uh, to, to capture that, that uh, yeah, it, he could never be like, as I say, like Judge Dredd, there must be other characters who are, you know, they're settled in their world. And there must be something, there's something very reassuring about that in a way. You know, it's like Sherlock Holmes, he's in Baker Street and along comes a problem and his landlady, you know, lets someone in. And uh, I, I kind of like all those kind of stories because they are safe and reassuring. Mm. But um, Slane has always had that maverick quality, which is me trying to understand the... Um, the anarchic nature of Celts, of the original Celts. And of course, I, I think it's arguably still there in their descendants today in Wales, Scotland and Ireland. <laughs> you know, they're definitely different to the English. <laughs> yes, yeah, which I think what makes Slain a very interesting addition to, to 2008 and a very unique character. And, and thank you very much for, for talking with me. Thank you very much for creating Slain and having a, a wonderful journey over 40 years now 40 40 years Christ. Yeah. yeah thank wow. you very much well thank you okay, okay. cheers bye-bye